good morning. Welcome you to worship this morning on this fourth Sunday of Advent here at Mayo Memorial United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Amy Chapman, and it is my joy to welcome you into this space as you prepare your hearts to worship the living God. Let us call one another now into worship. Would you respond to the words on your screen? Now is the time of watching and waiting, the time of pregnant expectation of new life. Now is the season of hope unfolding, the dark winter season when hope is waiting to be born. Let us come before God with receptive and willing spirits. May our souls magnify God's name and may our spirits rejoice in God our Savior. Rejoice! God comes to bring the birthday of life and hope. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father God, there is no miracle as grand as birth. As we prepare this morning for the coming of your Son, Jesus, create in us new life, O God. Transform us that we may reflect the light of your Son and may become beacons of kindness, goodness, compassion, generosity, honesty, patience, and peace. For the sake of the one whose name brings deliverance and life to all the world, Jesus Christ, our infant King. Amen. I invite you to join me as we sing together our hymn of praise, O Come, All You Faithful, verses 1, 2, and 3. As we prepare to light the fourth candle on our Advent wreath, hear these words. This is the season of Advent, the time we get ready to celebrate the mystery of Christmas, the time we are all on the way to Bethlehem. But who will show us the way?
the light of the prophets, the light of hope. the light of the Holy Family, the light of peace. The light of the shepherds, the light of joy. The Magi are on the way to Bethlehem, and they can show us the way also. The Magi saw a special star in the sky, a star for a king. They followed the star to Bethlehem, bringing gifts for the newborn king, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This is the candle of the Magi, the candle of love. It reminds us of gifts of God's gift of Christ, the newborn King. Enjoy the light of the Magi, the light of love. As we come together in this community of faith, it is a gift to us that we are able to share in one another's joys, that we are able to share in one another's burdens. So I would invite you now, if you would, to take a few moments to connect with one another, welcome one another into this space of worship, and also take time to rejoice together, to pray together, to connect your spirits with one another's spirit. Would you share your prayer joys and concerns in your comments today as we come into this time of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy God, come to us, abide with us. Our Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. You came to us long ago as a helpless babe, as one in need of human love and care. You taught us how to love, how to care for one another. Help us, O oh God, in these days to hold on to childlike wonder, amazement, to hold on to love, and to help us to love one another, not just today, O oh God, but all of our days. Guide our feet into the way of peace as only the Prince of Peace can lead us by laying down our lives for one another and serving one another in loving the least, in loving and forgiving our enemy. Lord, for those that are on our hearts now, we come to you, O God, in faithful prayer. We thank you, O God, that you hear us even when we cannot say the words, you hear our hearts, O oh God. So Lord, hear our prayers this morning for those who are in need, for those who are sick, for those who are troubled, for those who are left out, for those who are forgotten. For all these things, Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer, and hear us, O God, in the name of Christ, our Emmanuel, God with us, as we pray together the words Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, it's a joy for me to welcome now to bring you today's message on this fourth Sunday of Advent, the Reverend Brad Smart, who is our Kentucky East District Superintendent, as he shares with us today from the Gospel of Luke. I want to read the scripture for us this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, starting at verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her, in her, in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was a little kid, my mom and dad earned extra income by delivering newspapers for the Lexington Herald. Uh, back then, newspapers could be thrown from the, the vehicle onto the customer's driveway or onto their sidewalk. And because they could drive the route, they were able to have several hundred customers in our neighborhood. Uh, still, it probably took them an hour and a half or two hours to complete the route each morning. There was a period of time in my childhood when I was probably six or seven years old that I would wake up early in the morning while my mom and dad were out delivering newspapers, and I would be overwhelmed with fear. Now, I was safe. Uh, my mom and dad would not, they would never leave a, a six-year-old home alone. Uh, I had an older brother and sister who were living at home, and so I was safe. But as a small child, I felt terrified. And for a period of time, at least several months, I would wake up while they were gone, get out of bed, walk into our living room, and I would sit in front of our large living room window and wait. I would sit there, afraid, unable to go back to sleep. I would sit there looking out the window, waiting, waiting for their headlights to pull into our driveway. And as soon as I saw my mom and dad pulling into our driveway, I walked back to my room, crawled back in bed, and went to sleep. Now, I never told my mom and dad about this, but I remember sitting in front of the window, sitting in the darkness, being kept awake by fear, waiting for the lights to appear. And when I saw those headlights, my fear disappeared. When I saw those headlights, I felt safe once again. In Isaiah chapter 9, the prophet writes, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. I finally outgrew that fear. 
I stopped waking up while they were gone. I stopped getting out of bed. I stopped sitting in the dark and looking out the window. But as I've gotten older, I've had other fears that have kept me awake at night. I've had moments when I couldn't go back to sleep. I've had to do battle against anxious thoughts. And I've had plenty of days filled with sadness. But you want to know something? I've had plenty of days filled with joy as well. I've had moments when I've witnessed the miraculous, moments when I've encountered God's mercy, moments when I've received God's grace, moments when I've seen God's glory. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Last Sunday, for me, was one of those moments, a moment when I was reminded that the light has dawned. I don't know about you, but I've, I've lost my sense of time during this pandemic. At times, it's been hard to distinguish the days of the week. They all seem to run together, uh, and it's hard to notice when we have gone from one month to the next. You know, I'm thinking about New Year's Eve this year, and and New Year's Day, and, and I'm not sure it's going to mean what it normally means to me. I probably won't even stay up until 12.01 like I normally do. But, but something happened last Sunday that stirred my soul. Literally, it made my heart skip a beat. You know, our, our current situation causes many of us to feel like we're walking in darkness. But last Sunday, in the midst of the darkness, Advent arrived, and it caught me by surprise. Last Sunday, I was awakened by Advent. Now, in the midst of darkness, we began to hear the words of the prophet Isaiah, for to us, a child is born, to us, a son is born is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this morning, my heart continues to be awakened by the words we hear in the Gospel of Luke. We read of the encounter between the angel Gabriel and Mary, a young girl from a tiny place called Nazareth. Gabriel appears and announces unbelievable news. He says, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary responds to Gabriel's announcement with a question. How? How will this be? Mary hears this unexpected news, this unbelievable announcement, and she does what most of us would do. She questions the messenger. How can this be? You know, this is not the first time that the angel Gabriel had been questioned. Earlier in the same chapter in Luke's gospel, we hear the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Gabriel appears to Zechariah in the temple and announces that his wife Elizabeth would become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they were to name him John. Zechariah questions the messenger. How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Mary asks the question, how can this be since I am a virgin? Zechariah asks, how can I be sure of this because I'm old and my wife is well along in years? You know, what's fascinating is Gabriel's response to each of them. Do you remember Gabriel's response to Zechariah? After Zechariah asked his question, the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent 
and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Apparently, Zachariah's question was motivated by doubt. His question revealed that he did not believe what Gabriel was saying. Now, Zechariah was a righteous man. Uh, in fact, Luke says that he was blameless. He, he trusted in God. He was faithful to God. He served God. And yet this, this moment, this announcement, it was just too much to believe. Even though Zechariah and Elizabeth had been praying for a child, even though the angel Gabriel was standing right in front of him, he just couldn't believe what he was hearing. And so his question came from a place of doubt. But Mary's question was different. We learn from Gabriel's response to Mary's question that Mary did believe. Mary trusted. Now, did she understand everything? No. Did she fully comprehend this crazy plan? No. But she trusted the messenger. She trusted the word spoken by the angel Gabriel. She trusted the word of the Lord. I think Mary has something to teach us about how we approach this season of Advent and, and how we approach this difficult moment in history. So what can we learn from Mary's words? When Mary asks, how can this be? I don't believe we hear skepticism, but, but rather we hear a childlike curiosity. We know that Mary was really young. Some even suggest she was 12 or 13 years old. She was a virgin. She was engaged or betrothed to Joseph, but they were not officially completely married. She was still a child. Do you remember what Jesus said about children? During his ministry, Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. And one of the things he said to us was that unless we become like little children, that we would never enter the kingdom. Unless we have a childlike faith, a faith that trusts, a faith that relinquishes control of our lives to God, we'll never experience the fullness of God's kingdom. I think Mary's question reveals a childlike trust. She's not questioning God's ability. She's just expressing her faith and her desire to understand how this will happen, how this will take place. In this difficult moment, this chaotic season of life on earth for us, I invite you to ask your questions from a place of trust. Approach God with that childlike faith. God, what are you up to? Lord, how are you going to redeem this moment? Lord, how are we going to witness your power? Lord, where are we going to see your glory? In this season of Advent, in the midst of a pandemic, Lord, how will you give beauty instead of ashes? the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. I believe in Mary we see faith instead of doubt. But that's not all we see. Following her question and Gabriel's response, Mary confesses, I am the Lord's servant. Mary hears this announcement, she, she hears the part she will play in the story, and she willingly accepts her role. You know, we read in the, the English text, uh, the most familiar way we hear it is, Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. But in the original text, Mary actually says, here I am the Lord's servant. She says, here I am. Those words are familiar because we hear them spoken in the Old Testament. When God calls to Abraham, Abraham replies, here I am. When God calls to young Samuel, Samuel replies, here I am. When God calls Isaiah in the temple, Isaiah replies, here I am. 
But there's something unique about Mary's statement. You know, Abraham and Isaiah and Samuel, they respond to God's calling their name. But it's before they hear the specifics of the call. You know, really, they're just answering to God saying their name, stating their name, speaking their name, saying, here I am. But Mary, Mary says, here I am, after she hears the plan. Mary is willing to say, I am your servant, even after she learns about the difficult path that she would walk. I don't think we appreciate how difficult it was for Mary. Several years ago, my family and I watched the film uh, called The Nativity Story. Um, it was released originally in 2006, and then it came out on DVD. And so we were able to, to have a copy of the DVD, and we watched it together. It basically tells the story of Mary and Joseph and the birth of Jesus. And one of the most moving scenes for me was the scene where Mary returns home to Nazareth after visiting her relatives, Zachariah and Elizabeth. Mary rides into her village on the back of a, a cart pulled by a donkey. And as her family and neighbors see her coming, they all run to greet her, and they're celebrating her return and offering her a, a very warm homecoming. But as she steps off the back of the cart, it becomes evident that something is different. It becomes clear to everyone that Mary is pregnant. And the mood of the homecoming drastically changes. The excitement is gone. The giggles and the laughter of the children is replaced by the whispers of the crowd. And you can see the anger in the eyes of her neighbors. You can see the disappointment and shame in the eyes of her parents. You can see the hurt in the eyes of Joseph. That scene brought home to me the reality of Mary's situation. Yes, an angel had appeared to her. Yes, she was willing to be the Lord's servant. But that did not soften the blow she would feel as she faced the rejection of her people. That would not make it any easier to face the disapproving glances of her neighbors. And in many ways through this, Mary would learn that she would have her own cross to carry. Although she wouldn't understand that fully years later. But in this moment, this difficult moment, as she realized what it would cost her, she was saying, willingly saying, here I am. I am the Lord's servant. And in Mary's words, we see a person who is selfless. Selfless Mary, humble and willing to be the Lord's servant. So what else do we see? In Mary's question and statement, I believe we see the difference between expectancy and expectation. You might think those two things are the same, but they are vastly different. I think we can define expectation as uh, what we think we deserve, which of course, when we do not receive or experience what we think we deserve, we're disappointed, we're disheartened. Sometimes we get angry. 2020 has been a major disappointment. So much has been canceled. So much has been postponed. Weddings, graduations, birthday parties, vacations, family gatherings. So many of those important moments in life, we were not able to enjoy them in the way we expected. And it has led to disappointment and anger for many of us. I remember back in, in June, uh, my family and I were blessed to be able to get away for a, a few days to go to the beach. We got to the beach and we, we, we checked into the place where we were staying, and then it rained for the first two days, which I think is a typical 2020. We're at the beach and it's raining. I, I remember waking up that first morning and, and I always love to go out on the beach and watch the sunrise first thing when we get to the beach on our vacations, I want to see the sun come up over the ocean. 
but woke up on that first morning. I looked out the window expecting to see the sun beginning to come up over the water, and it wasn't there. There was no sun, nothing but clouds and rain, and then it rained that whole day. I expected to see the sun. I, I thought I deserved to see the sun. After all we'd been through this year, I deserved to see the sunrise. And when I didn't get what I thought I deserved and what I expected, I was disappointed, maybe even depressed, and then a little bit angry. There's a difference between expectation and expectancy. And what we see in Mary's life is not a set of expectations, but rather an attitude of expectancy. Expectation sees the things we think we deserve. Expectancy reveals our hopefulness, our openness to what God wants to do in our life. Mary's not focused on what she thinks she deserves out of life. She's focused on the beautiful, serendipitous adventure that God is calling her to take. Stepping out in faith, trusting in the goodness of God. She can't wait to see what God will do. She says, here I am. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. In Mary's life, we see a beautiful childlike faith. We see a humble, willing servant. We see a hope-filled expectancy. Here I am. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me according to your word. As you walk through these days of Advent, may you experience the joy of Jesus' coming. May you experience the wonder of Jesus' birth. And may you know the hope that Jesus brings to our lives so that we may share the love that he has so freely given. I pray God's blessings upon your life today. Amen.
as we respond now in our hearts to all these things that we ponder, I invite you to now take a moment to affirm your faith as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we respond today to God's grace, I would ask that you would consider in what ways that God is calling you to be faithful with the covenant that you have made with his holy church as we prepare our hearts to give today. Let us pray together. Gracious and generous God, 
we offer our gifts to you, knowing full well we have devoted so much more energy into finding the gifts for our families and much less on the gifts that we offer to you. Forgive us, O Lord, and remind us today that you gave Mary, an unmarried girl, a son so that the world might have a Savior. And her response was so simple. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. O oh God, may her affirmation of faith and obedience be the gift we offer to you today. In Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, as you go forth, carry the light of love of Jesus Christ into the world with you and know that God goes before you in his grace. May you go in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>